Hi guys. Thanks for joining us again today at Liberty. I'm Crystal Nash, and today we're going to talk about positive reinforcement, the science behind it, and what you need to do to get the most out of your training time with your horse. Our goal here is to build a bond with trust and communication in order to teach our horse partnership and uh, hopefully actually enjoy themselves as much as we do. So hopefully we will uh, tackle the four quadrants today of training, which are positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, positive punishment, and negative punishment. Uh, in those four quadrants of training, we're going to discuss uh, how they work, give some examples, and how we can modify those training methods in order to better utilize positive reinforcement and its efficacy. So stay tuned and uh, let's get started on quadrant one. Quadrant one, positive reinforcement in our training module is about uh, utilizing positive reinforcement methods such as food, praise, uh, and other methods that stimulate uh, dopamine release in the brain to create neural connections to uh, connect a stimuli and a cue in order to create a, an intentional behavior. So uh, utilizing clicker training is the most accepted uh, method of positive reinforcement training where we introduce a uh, small behavior uh, that we are asking in uh, conjunction with trying to get them to utilize cognitive function to figure out what it is that you are asking. So uh, utilizing these communication methods, we use um, simple commands of things that they naturally do, such as laying down. When you teach a horse to lay down, the easiest way to do it is catch the behavior in the act. Once you've introduced your horse to the uh, clicker and you are able to teach them its meaning, that that click means, yes, that's what I want you to do. That's what I'm asking for. And we utilize food usually in order to strengthen that relationship of, yes, that's a good behavior. Uh, instead of focusing on uh, correcting negative behaviors, we ignore those behaviors and we only focus on the correct aspect of what we're trying to do, utilizing body position, body language, and uh, communication, both through our primary objective, which is our click, our secondary objective, which is our vocal reward, such as good job or good, or and our tertiary reward, which is our food in our case. Uh, we always start with low value rewards, such as hay and grain, uh, hay pellets, uh, anything that's low calorie, that is uh, just a hand to mouth is really what we're trying to establish is, uh, oh, that's good, okay, I get a little something. Uh, think of it like giving uh, an M&M to a child who's learning how to potty train. You give one M&M for going pee and two for going poo. Um, in those types of training circumstances that we utilize in, in human behavior, and we've learned the efficacy of uh, establishing a desire to perform, we uh, utilize specific treats and specific goals those treats are usually, uh, we try to focus their uh, size value to the behavior value. Uh, something that is bigger and requires more concentration and effort, we give higher value rewards. Now I'm uh, privy to using carrots, baby carrots, small pieces, maybe a, a quarter or a third of a baby carrot for something like a, a look away where you're teaching manners to establish spatial awareness within you and your horse in order to stop unwanted behaviors such as nipping or being pushy for food. Um, that is quadrant one and how we utilize that for our training aspects and why it is most effective. Now we enter quadrant two, which is the most widely and used method in horse training. Quadrant two is negative reinforcement, or as most people in the horse world know this, this is called pressure release. So pressure release utilizes engagement of stimuli such as your leg or a rein, and you are putting pressure, uh, usually to an uncomfortable degree on your horse, asking them to move away from the pressure. That movement away from the pressure is their release. That is the reward. The reward for pressure of pain is to move yourself away from the pressure in order to have that relax 
moment where you're no longer feeling that pressure. So if somebody's pushing you, pushing you, pushing you, if you step away and they stop pushing you, they've released the pressure and that in itself is the reward. The problem with pressure release is even though it's effective for an immediate compliance similar to the form of corporal punishment when dealing with human behavior, is you do get that immediate compliance but it comes at a cost in the long run. It comes at developing a, a fight or flight response to the person rather than the stimuli. So when you are introduced to other stimuli and other variables where it's not just a horse and a person and trying to remove, uh, the horse is trying to remove itself from the stimuli in order to feel relief, when there's another stimuli that is outside of your control, at that point the reactive behavior of your animal becomes um, something that becomes a problem behavior. So uh, in creating that immediate compliance through force, you are telling your horse uh, when other stimuli are around that now there is two reasons to have uh, a reaction of fight or flight, both the external stimuli that you can't control and the unknown behavior of how you are going to react or retaliate, which is also going to stimulate an amygdala response of the reptile brain. So um, utilizing negative reinforcement gets you your immediate compliance, but long term it also creates a, a stronger fight or flight uh, reaction to you as the stimuli instead of creating um, a, a smaller reaction to the stimuli, is, which is ultimately what your goal is. So that is uh, pressure relief, pressure release and quadrant two of our training module. Now we go into quadrant three, which is positive punishment. So a horse doesn't move with the direction you want them to do, so you smack them with a crop. You are trying to rid a behavior or get the horse to remove a behavior by introducing a positive, introducing a something you are giving to them, a punishment. Uh, physical punishment is the number one means of positive punishment. So you smack your horse because they aren't doing what they want. Uh, yes, you can get them to immediately snap back and, and whoa, 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 she just hit me. And uh, you'll get that immediate compliance again, but long-term reaction, you're still using the adrenaline response of a horse instead of that dopamine response. So you're creating a reactive animal instead of uh, a thinking cognitive animal who can uh, put their amygdala responses aside in order to think about what it is that you're asking of them. This trust that you build with your horse when you ignore uh, bad behaviors or you um, focus more on the good, it helps build a desire for them to continue to try and, and please you because pleasing you is, is a rewarding experience for them as well. Um, that is quadrant three as we talk about positive punishment, uh, the lack of efficacy in the long run, and why it is the number one uh, training method that we use in horses when we are not getting an immediate response. Uh, as we uh, covered one, two, three of the first quadrants, which uh, positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, positive punishment, and then negative punishment. Negative punishment is when we remove things for bad behavior in hopes of getting a positive behavior. One of the most common things you see in the horse world is the patience post. Now, the patience post is used to stop horses who are reactive. Um, the thought process behind the patient's post is remove their food and water and their freedom and they will submit to you. Now, again, if you walk up to a horse who uh, has been tied up and removed of food and water and other basic essentials, you are really activating that uh, fight or flight response, that survival mechanism at that point. Um, when you activate a survival mechanism on, on an animal that you're sitting on top of and that horse feels the need to try and um, protect itself in order to survive, it becomes a dangerous situation. So uh, tying a horse to a patient's post, for example, and removing all those needs for survival, um, what you're essentially doing is you're tiring the horse out. You are not teaching that horse anything more than by disobeying he has uh, a real risk of being um, of, of dying or being in a threatening environment. 
So again, that fear that you are instilling in them not to mess up is not the same thing as a desire to get it right. Um, we really want to focus on uh, teaching them what we want, not what we don't want. Um, you can tell somebody, I don't want you to go over there. And that person will look around and say, well, is this okay? Well, is this okay? Well, is this okay? As they're trying to find what it is that you are looking for. Um, there's always that fear of retaliation and punishment when you live in that fear, uh, when you develop those negative connotations with the people who take care of you, and that fear of making a mistake often causes uh, a lot of neurotic behaviors, um, depression, and uh, an inability to deal with external stimuli in a healthy manner. Those behaviors are taught. Those behaviors are not innate. Uh, we are not born as humans, as animals, uh, with the ability to have all the answers. We have to figure those out through slow and gradual process of learning. And when you instill that as a positive experience, you create a desire to learn. That desire to learn is ultimately what partnering is all about. So hopefully we see you out there with your clickers and your positive reinforcement and your praise, and you continue to build that healthy, happy relationship with your horse. We'll see you again next time here at Liberty. I'm Crystal Nash. Have a great day.